ask our prayer team to come forward. If you have a need this morning, please feel free to come up and we'll pray with you. We'll continue in worship. Who's loving goes through generations? 
before I spoke a word. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so church.
so I said this first service but I was the one that he left the 99 for <laughs> a couple years ago I came walking in here and I felt pretty lost and it's tough when you feel like you're out there on your own but man his love is reckless because he left all of you guys to come find me and if you're sitting here today and that's you it's all of us actually <laughs> so as we go back into this chorus I just want you guys to pour it out pour it out from the depths of your heart because listen if you have no idea who he is yet he's called you he's calling you now so let's go back into this chorus and let's just sing from the depths of who we are we're thankful that we serve a king who would leave all the praise, all the glory, and all the love of heaven for us. Father, so many of us can share and relate to Kimberly. She's saying, yeah, he left all of you to come find me one day. And Jesus, we're so thankful for your love that you would leave everything to come and find us. And in turn today, Jesus, we just want to lift you up and honor you and praise your name. You're the only one who is worthy. You're the only one who deserves our praise because your love is so, so great. And so today on this Palm Sunday, we sing Hosanna in the highest. You are worthy. Let your name be lifted high. And as your name is lifted high, would you draw all of us closer to you today? We walk out of here changed with a different perspective of what you have for us. We give you all the praise and all the glory. And everyone said, Amen. hey, if Jesus has been good to you, give him a shout of praise. Yeah. He's worthy. Amen. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor. Tell them they're looking snazzy on this Sunday morning. wonderful, wonderful Sunday. I know I am. I am happy to be here with all of you and all your smiling faces. You guys look snazzy this morning. But hey, real quick, if you are with us for the first time, thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday morning to be here. Uh, we would love to meet you on a more personal level, so make sure you head back to the information area just so we can get uh, our handshake and get to know your name. Uh, we also have a card back there. It says connect on it. If you don't mind filling that out today, we'd really, really appreciate it. It's simply so we as a staff know who you are and how we can best serve you and your household. And then also make sure you stop by to get a Change Life coffee mug, our way of saying thank you for being here today. We're excited you're with us. And it's a big coffee mug. I'm thinking about putting some French onion soup in it today. It sounds really good. Anyways, I'm moving on. Ice cream, that works too, all right? It's a, it's a good-sized coffee mug. But hey, I got a couple quick announcements, and then I promise to get out of your way. Uh, next Sunday, if you don't know, is a, is a pretty big Sunday. It's kind of a big deal to us. Uh, it's Easter, and so we are excited to worship and celebrate with all of you. Uh, however, we don't want it to just be with just you. So in the back, on your way out today, make sure you grab an invite card. Grab them. They're right at the information table. Grab them. Invite your coworkers. Invite your friends. Invite your family. Bring them all out. And we're going to have a good time celebrating next week as we celebrate Easter across the street at CUNA High School in the Performing Arts Center. We are looking forward to a great day of hanging out, celebrating, and some good games because we've got like 5,000 Easter eggs that we need to give out to these students. So if you took Easter eggs home to stuff them with eggs, 
we're going to need those back. Otherwise, the Easter egg hunt is going to be really short. All right? So if you have them at home and you forgot to bring them in, not a problem at all. We're going to have a bucket outside uh, throughout the week. And so if you, uh, you, you can drop them off anonymously. So we won't even know it's you. Just put them in the basket and leave. And you'll be totally fine. No one's going to judge you except for the security camera that's out there. Um, I'm just kidding. But no, if you could bring them back in case you didn't today, please get those back to us. We need them because we'll be setting up and moving everything over on Saturday. So if you bring it Sunday, it's too late. We need them by Thursday this week to get them loaded up into the truck for us. Uh, Also... Uh, looking at that, we got inflatables going on next week, so all the kids are going to be able to play and have fun and go crazy. We got some food trucks showing up, some coffee and things like that. We're looking forward to just a great day of hanging out and, and having a good party after service. So make sure you join us, but it is one service. Turn to your neighbor and say one service, one service. at 10 a.m. It's highly important that you know it's one service at 10 a.m. over at Cuna High School. Looking forward to a great day. Invite your friends, invite your family, grab that invite card on the way out. Uh, that's really all I have for announcements because that's really the big thing going on. Other than that, this Wednesday night, there is no midweek service. So just be aware, if you show up on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, no one's going to be here. Have your Bible study, go for it, but no one's going to be here, okay? We're looking forward to that, though. Looking forward to a great Sunday. It's going to be a great week as we celebrate and prepare for Easter. Uh, If you would like to participate in giving today, you can do so many ways. You can give online, you can text to give, you can mail it in, or you can drop it off. Either way, we just want to say thank you that you would want to partner with us in your giving so that we can make days like next Sunday happen for our community. We're looking forward to it. So thank you so much for your partnership through your giving. Pastor Stan. It's Pastor Stevie. Good morning, church. Yeah, I want to I want to brag on your giving too, guys. Um, it we're going to get into this new building debt free. So I want to. We we thought it was going to be close, but we looked at our our finances and stuff this last week, and we're it's going to happen. So I'm super excited about it. Uh, we're about to do a baby dedication, and so uh, I love baby dedications. I do. So I know the family. You know you're supposed to be up here. Uh, come on up, the family. It is. I know there's a huge amount of people here. You're not all supposed to come up here because some of you're scared to death. But. Uh, but I told Kylie, just let those who know they're supposed to be up here, be up here. And if you see any people that are posing as family members, just let me know. Um, so you, you got to come up on the stage and it's going to be, it's going to be, y'all don't, I love baby, this, this is, this is baby Atlas. I absolutely, oh, you guys, you guys aren't the thing. You got to get in the back. All right. Okay. <laughs> I see how this works. <laughs> you know, not everybody's. Todd, you can just, you can just stay down. You know, you know <laughs> Todd's my big guy. So as all y'all, you know, when Todd lifted me up in our, when we did our thing, that had the most hits on anything we ever posted as the church. And so uh, the one that's going to out hit that one is when I lift him up on my shoulder. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is at the beginning of the heaven uh, when that'll happen. But all right. Well, hey. Austin and Kylie, you've produced beautiful, beautiful children. This is baby Atlas, and I know you have big hopes and dreams by naming your son Atlas. (laughs) This guy's going to be bigger than Todd. Um, Atlas Jason, uh, so, so proud to be able to be a part of this, um, because I've watched you grow up. I mean, you were little when you came here. Um, Cameron's always been taller than me, but uh, (laughs) whatever, that's his sister. Uh, but I love baby dedications because to me, they're, they're fun and they're serious at the same time. Uh, why do we dedicate? Well, in the Bible, Mary brought Jesus uh, to the synagogue to, to dedicate him. Hannah brought Samuel, a little boy. She brought him and she actually left him there, dropped him off and left him. Uh, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> and um, he was raised by a man named Eli. And that's why we dedicate. And we know that God has an amazing plan for you, young man, that, that you are in God's mind... It, that was like a shocker moment, he does, um, that God has a plan for this young boy. Before he was even thought of, before he was conceived, there was a plan. And we see that in the book of Isaiah. It's like, before I was formed, you knew me. And so that's what is so much fun to me uh, to do that. A couple of reasons that we do this. Number one, Proverbs 22 says, Trade, uh, train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, 
he will not depart from it. Now, there's no promise in here that they will serve God their entire life. It says when he's old, he won't depart from us. For those of you who have uh, children that have strayed, just continue to pray for them. And the other one says uh, in Proverbs 22, 15, says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Uh, that's not a famous uh, one to quote at a baby dedication. But, but for Atlas to become what God wants him to be, discipline has to be applied. Um, not just, you know, reprimands and spankings and whatnot, but there's a discipline that he will see in your guys' lives as Christians that, that he needs to say, okay, they're living what they're preaching. And when you fail, that you ask for forgiveness and you make a mistake, you apologize. Um, he needs to see that serving God works. And so I'm going to ask you the question, family, will you live in a way that will cause him to want to love Jesus? Yes. All right. Church family. Bro, I like you, man. <laughs> He's got this fascination. This, I'm, like, I'm like a... I love it. He's, he's awesome. I like this guy. She's like, yeah, at 2 a.m. I'll drop him off. We'll see how awesome he is. But, uh, but church family, uh, we strive, we have striven, strove really hard. I don't even know if I said that right. We strive really hard as a family to be a family. Uh, dysfunctional at times. But I grew up in church. Many of you grew up in church. And many of you who have grown up in church have probably seen what church people can do to each other. And it can be vicious at times. It can be ungodly at times. And we have, again, made it here to say, we're not going to be that type of church. We're not going to be the kind of church that when he comes in here, he's scared of what's going to happen. He's going to be excited about the kids' ministry and what's going on. And so church, will you live in a way that will cause him to love Jesus his whole life? Can you do that? All right. Well, let's pray for him. Father, I thank you so much for Atlas. I thank you uh, for the purpose and the plan that you have for him. Uh, there's a great, great, great future for this young man, and we dedicate him to you today. I ask, Father, you would bless him, that we'd fill him with your spirit, uh, give his parents strength, um, help them to know how to raise him with this particular type of personality, how to guide him and lead him, and know that great things are to follow. We love and give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Atlas Jays, I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Well, thank you, family. All right. The stage held up with a large family is great. <laughs> That's great. All right. That's good. All right. Well, how's everybody doing? Good. Doing all right? Anybody have a week that you're just like, I'm glad the week's over? Yeah. yeah. Good one. Um, I love Mondays because Mondays is not the beginning of my week, but uh, many of you know uh, Kristen did not lead today. She, her voice is still strained, and so we're, I, I told her, like, take care of your voice. Amen. I told her quit smoking cigars because um, that's just how we roll around. We just joke. She, she, she doesn't, but um, so I would, I would ask on her behalf, uh, try not to, like, swarm her and talk to her too much because I'm like, she was talking, and you know how she can vocalize when she talks. I'm like, turn it down, because I, like, I want to save your voice. So we're going to watch it out for her. So anyway, just answering the question, you may have been wondering why. Uh, we're just trying to protect her voice. So uh, with Easter coming up, it's pretty important. Uh, so thankful you're here. Uh, if you're here for the first time, when I grew up in church, uh, I think I mentioned this Wednesday night or maybe last Sunday. Uh, I'm over 50 now. I don't remember what I said yesterday. Uh, but I, I said when, when we had new visitors show up at church, when I grew up, it was like, hey, stand up, introduce yourself, and tell us who you are. Uh, are you glad we got away from that? Yeah. It was like, it was, it's always a scary thing. It's the embarrassment. But then you get that one person that wants to tell you their entire life story. And so that's probably why we quit doing that. But I want to thank you for being here, if, it's, if you're here for the first time. Uh, I know, again, it can kind of be scary sometimes going to church, you're not sure what to expect. Uh, but what I hope to do today is to leave you better than you came in, uh, leave you with some hope that, that God has a plan for your life, and whether you're an atheist, whether you don't believe in God, or whether, you, you know, God just exists, but he's not really a part of my life, uh, God does have something for you today. He really, he really does, and I'm excited, again, where we're going as a church, I'm excited with our new building. We're getting closer and closer. Uh, one practical way you can help, uh, if, you, if you noticed this morning, uh, we started putting dirt piles in the planter boxes. And so I'm going to invent something called a, a, a adopt a planter box. And so here's, here's what I'm going to ask some of you to do. If you like working in the dirt with a rake and a shovel, uh, is to, to adopt one planter box, okay, and smooth the dirt out. You have one job. Adopt a planter box and smooth the dirt out. It's pretty easy. It would probably take a half an hour. Um, don't use it as punishment for your teenagers because then they'll hate church. Use it as a blessing 
to your pastor. Right? And so anyways, that's, that's one practical way that you can help. If you want to do it any time this week, uh, I think it's probably a little bit muddy now, but just smooth it out, and uh, you don't have to do a level or anything, but that would be a little bit helpful. So, all right, Palm Sunday 2024. What is... Palm Sunday, what does it mean? You see it on the calendar and you kind of wonder. I know on our calendar says you see Ramadan, you see all these different you know, countries have these different things and you may not know what is Palm Sunday. Well, there's a deep, deep meaning and unless you have like eight years of theological study at a seminary, you're probably not gonna understand what Palm Sunday is about. Yeah. So you ready? Yeah. I'm gonna teach you. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, they cut palm branches off of palm trees and waved them and put them down. Change your life. That's what Palm Sunday is. There is no deep hidden meaning in it, right? Some of you could probably create one, but that's what Palm Sunday is about. We're going to get to that point. But first, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, when Chris and I met, we met in Bible college, and it was, I think, about three years after we got married. That I was up here for a year, but she had this little car, a little Nissan, and it was called a Stanza. If you remember that, a Nissan Stanza, it was like an early 80s, it was a beater, man. It was like, I think it was rattle canned white and uh, just, it was, it was kind of a beater and she blew a head gasket in it and so I decided to fix it because I was fairly mechanical. Uh, there were some things I didn't know, some things I found out the hard way and so my dad's born in Meridian, back when Meridian was kind of country, uh, you know, took, her, took it apart, put a new head gasket on there and put it back together and started it and, and it cranked really hard. It went, grr, grr. It's a four-cylinder, and then went room, dun, 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 dun. it was running, and it was popping. I was like, "Oh no, what happened?" And I realized as I took everything apart that I had the timing incorrect. And on a zero clearance engine, that is very bad. If you don't know anything about it, pistons come up, and if your valves are down, it hits your valve and bends your valve. I learned the importance of timing, but more importantly, I learned this: that sometimes in life, this didn't turn out the way I expected. Now, fortunately, she still married me, but with a, a car named Stanza, there's a little bit of a prophecy in there. Now, I would play on this. Stan's amazing. <laughs> Stanza the man. I, I would play these things. Stanza a failure at replacing a head and putting the timing in backwards. I, I don't like learning the hard way. I would rather learn from your mistakes than my own. I'd rather you tell me the story of how you had the timing marks off on the car. But because of the situation, I thought, you know, it's a good story to tell. This didn't turn out the way I expected. And oftentimes in life, that's the way life is. And so today's title really is called A Divine Disappointment. We're going to find out as we go through this story of, of Palm Sunday and the week before Jesus' crucifixion, some things that took place that were way beyond the expectations of the people. Matter of fact, they were the opposite of the expectation. Um, I wrote down here too, box dye fails. Have you ever seen somebody, because my daughter Lexi does hair professionally, and she will show me a picture of box dye fails, of, of, of ladies that you know, try to dye their hair with a box dye and it just turns out all crazy. Anybody ever have that happen? Okay, anybody willing to admit that it has happened? And, uh, and we got into quite a discussion in first service that we won't get into now because it went way sideways uh, with a particular staff member that took offense to what I said. Um, I won't tell you it was Katie, but uh, it, uh, now Katie, she knows how to dye her own hair really good. Like she's got, the way, and she took it totally wrong. It didn't turn out the way I expected. I was trying to compliment her. Is Katie still here? Oh she's, oh, she's working with your children. Good. We can say a little more than we said for service. Uh, I said, but very few people really do a good job on box dye. Well, Katie does. She, she actually does a really good job with her hair. Even Lexi's like, yeah, she actually does a pretty good job. And then I was corrected. It's not box dye. It's real dye. And I'm like, I don't care. It's dye. Dye is dye. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the truth. That's like, yeah. Anyhow, so I got into trouble first service, and I thought I would share that with you, because it didn't turn out the way I expected. I meant it as a compliment, and it turned into savagery, but let's move on. All right, Jesus, I'm going to read to you the first part of this message. Uh, we're going to do a little bit different than normal today. I'm going to kind of teach through this, uh, this whole story. Uh, I would encourage you to go read it. Go read the story of Easter. Read it in different books, because there's different authors that saw some different things that happened. We're going to go to the book of Matthew in just a few moments and get Matthew's perspective on this. But for the sake of time, I'm going to read you my intro. And Jesus is in the last few weeks of his life on earth. 33 and a half years ago, he was born for one purpose. 
He wasn't born to raise the dead. He wasn't born to heal the blind eyes. He wasn't born to cleanse the lepers. He wasn't born to produce more food than there really was. He wasn't born with a single purpose of healing people. He was born to die. He was born for the specific purpose of rescuing humans who could not rescue themselves. That was his main purpose. Now, he did a lot of good things. He did all the things I just said on his way to the cross, but he was born for one purpose. He's on his way to Jerusalem right now in our story to celebrate the Passover. And you may ask, what is the Passover? I know there's a lot of newer Christians here that may not know what the Passover is. Let me give you a brief synopsis of what the Passover is about. When the Israelites were held captive in Egypt, uh, there was plagues that were sent to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. There was 10 plagues in total. When, when God told Pharaoh, hey, you need to let my people go, he sent Moses to tell Pharaoh that. Pharaoh wouldn't do it. And so the plagues got worse and worse and worse. And finally, after Pharaoh again saying, yeah, you can leave, and then saying, no, you can't, God said, okay, on this particular night, there's going to be a death angel that is going to go over this, this country of Egypt, and he is going to kill the firstborn male of every household. He told the Jews, though, if you do this, you will be passed over. You must take a sacrificial lamb. You must kill it, and you must take its blood and put it on the doorpost of your house, basically the form of a cross. And when the death angel came over the house, he saw the blood applied because they listened. The death angel would skip that house. And so the, the, the Israelites have celebrated what they call the Passover because the death angel passed over the home that had the blood applied to it. It's very ironic, isn't it, that Jesus would go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of a sacrificial lamb of blood being applied to protect his people. Isn't that cool? God's timing is always perfect. Okay? So Jesus was on his way to celebrate this. What we'll do here is we will see that Jesus would become the one sacrifice once and for all. That all we have to do to get to heaven is believe that he did what he did on the cross, that he died for our sins, accept him and ask his forgiveness for our sins and we'll welcome him into our life and do the best we can to live for him. That's how we get to heaven. Amen. Isn't it good that we, all we have to do is ask? Like there's not a three-day waiting period to see if you're serious. It's the moment we ask Jesus into our life is the moment that we are saved. So Matthew's perspective, again, he's the tax collector. Um, he writes this story about what's happening. Jesus is the celebrity of the day. His disciples and the others believe that he has come to overthrow the Roman government and reestablish their kingdom on earth. He is the long-awaited Messiah that they have just expected, and they're really, really, really excited for this moment. Unfortunately, in their excitement and expectations about this new kingdom, they've missed an understanding of what Jesus keeps telling them, and that is this, I'm going to die. I am going to die. I am going to get killed when we get to Jerusalem, they somehow over and over again miss this thing. So first question I want us to deal with is this. Have you ever been so convinced of how something was going to turn out that you missed what should have been obvious? You're so convinced this is how it's going to work that you missed what should have been obvious. See, I will tell you and listen to me on this. Many disappointments are divine interventions. Many disappointments in your life, when you get past that and look back, you're like, oh my goodness. It was God that was saving me from something. There's a country song titled, I Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. It's actually a pretty powerful song because what we pray for at times isn't what God wants for us because he knows where it ends. But many disappointments are divine interventions. So if you're going through something right now that's just hard and you're disappointed with how life is and your life is submitted to Jesus, I will tell you this, you just hold on and keep going because God knows what you don't. Your job is to keep going and keep believing and turn your expectations down a little bit. All of us have an expectations dial, don't we? And the disciples here, they have the expectations dial all the way to, the, to high because they have this idea that Jesus is here to overthrow the Romans. We have been subject to the Romans for all these years and finding the Messiah is going to come and save us from it and we're going to rule our own country again. That's what they're thinking. They're thinking earthly minded. So there's a lot of this happening here, they're, they're, they're so convinced of how things are going to happen, they're missing the obvious. And so we're going to go through some scriptures, and we're going to go through this whole story in kind of a teaching method. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 28 through 30, we'll read this. It says, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, 
When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you, have, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, we look at that and go, okay, he's talking to his 12 disciples who have followed him over the course of about three and a half years. Okay, and you've, if you've seen The Chosen, you kind of know the story there. And he says that the renewal of all things, they're thinking, well, the end of this week is the renewal of all things because you're going to overthrow the Roman government and we're going to have an entire new kingdom in this particular week. Jesus is not talking about that. He is talking about new heaven and a new earth. Like after the rapture, after the tribulation, when all this thing goes crazy, there's a new heaven and a new earth. Read Revelation and you'll see what Jesus is actually talking about. They're thinking here and now. Jesus is talking about in the future. You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. And I think to these guys, that sounds pretty good. Like we get, we get 12 thrones. I mean, that kind of sounds fun, Right. We get 12 thrones? Let me continue reading from my Bible, because it's not on the thing. He says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields or for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Now, out of all of that that Jesus just told them, here's what they hear. You're going to sit on 12 thrones and judge it's like this ultimate power on earth and this new kingdom at the renewal of all things. You get to rule. You get to be the guy, the 12 guys. And, and this is pretty exciting. Now, when we go to chapter 20, here's what they didn't hear. Because, again, you'll find in life that the destination is not the same as the process. The, the destination that you want is the end result. It's not the process. When you get an airline ticket, you get it to a what? A destination. Okay, there's not the in between. It's you're going from Boise to wherever, and you type in leaving time, departure, and ending day. It doesn't tell you what happens in between. Can you imagine if it gave you a play by play? Like two hours into it, you will be offered coffee. Two hours and 17 minutes into it, the seatbelt light will come on because you're about to hit turbulence. 200 or two, you know, two hours and 18, and you have a child kicking the back of your seat. And, and 2019, you get into it with a parent because they don't care. Can you imagine the play by play? The, the process is different than the destination. We like the destination, we don't necessarily like to go through the process. So, in order for there to be a new heaven and a new earth, the Bible says that this one gets burned up. God promised, I will never flood the earth again. Now he's reserved it for fire. Okay, so that's really what's going to happen. So here's another thing that they didn't hear. Jesus predicts his death, chapter 20, verse 17 and 19. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. This is not too long after the other conversation. Twelve thrones. On the way, he took the twelve aside and he said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, which is him, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. And will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. You know, on the third day, he will be raised back to life. They are still, we get 12 thrones. He's saying, I am going to die. And you can't get any more specific than that. I am going to get handed over. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be killed on a Roman cross. And three days later... I'm going to come back to life. Now, we'll know next week's message is, is the fact that nobody was waiting at the tomb. Nobody expected him to come back to life. When everything didn't happen the way they thought, okay, they, they just, they was like, he must not have been the Messiah. They didn't hear this. Now, there's a woman who has this understanding about some thrones, and, and this is in chapter 20, verse 20 through 28. Let's read about it. Now, what you may not know, it just says this, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asked a favor. Now, some of you probably know this. Most of you, I guess, do not. The mother here, her name is Solome. Solome is Mary's sister. This is Jesus' auntie, favorite aunt. These two boys, James and John, are her cousins. There's Zebedee's sons. These are first cousins. So here you have an aunt who wants, wants Jesus probably grow up. She's probably like, you're my favorite nephew, All right? And, and he would have been. He was perfect, right? Jesus was perfect, so why not? So she comes, and her sons must have been talking, hey, Mom, there's 12 thrones. We get to sit on 12 thrones, and, like, this is probably going to happen next week because Jesus is here. He's going to overthrow the government. Everything's going to be great. And so she's like, 
12 thrones? I'm like, yeah. She's like, which ones do you get? I don't know. Never asked him. Do you think I could just go talk to my nephew and find out? Hey, who's sitting closest to you? Did she go on, you know, like you do Alaska Airlines and you pick your seat? Like, I know you're in the captain's chair. But can, what about captain and co-captain? Can, can we do this? And so she's working a little family magic here because she's human, right? Because we can just read the story and blow through it. But I want you to think about her emotions. And, and so she goes, she kneels in front of Jesus. She asks this favor. What is it you want, he asked. And I think Jesus probably knew exactly what she wanted because he did this over and over again. And she said, grant that one of these two sons of mine, your cousins, all right, may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. They want the two thrones of power, okay? Right hand, left hand man next to Jesus. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking, he said to them. Can you drink the cup? I'm going to drink. We can, they answered. Now, he was... Talking in metaphor here. He meant the cup, I'm going to get killed. Can you drink of that same cup? They're thinking golden goblet. They're like, oh, with diamonds. We we, we can drink out of the king's cup. Sure, we can do that. And he's like, you don't know what you're asking. We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, oh, you will indeed drink from my cup. All right. He is prophesying now because in the future, they would both get killed for their faith. They would both become martyrs. He's like, oh, you're going to die. They just had no idea what he was talking about. But to sit at my right or my left, it's not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. In other words, God's going to decide this. And when the ten heard about this, they were indignant. Indignant is, is Hebrew for ticked off. All right? They were indignant. They were so mad with the two brothers. And Jesus, noticing that a staff infection was happening amongst the twelve, he called them together and he said, Guys, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. He's like, these guys get bossed around, so just just give them a little bit of a break. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom. I mean, this is like a little sneaky preachy in there. It's like, so let me, I know, you, I know what you're asking. You want these two cousins of mine to sit in positions of authority. That's really not mine to grant. In other words, you need to be a servant. You've got to serve your way to the top. You can't just grab the throne just because you're a relative. So, again, 12 thrones. Can they sit closest to you? What they're really doing is they're jockeying for position. And this shouldn't happen amongst Christians. It shouldn't happen amongst believers. Because I know what didn't happen had the other 10 been really, really godly. And when they heard about James and John wanting to sit on the right and the left, they should have said, man, that's a great idea. I wish we would have thought of that. Guys, you totally deserve it. Man, you've been following Jesus. Guys, what do you think? Should we take a vote? Yeah, let's take a vote. All in favor, say aye. They should sit by you. Yeah, aye. Any nay, no nays. Motion carried 100%. Guys, have the throne. But that's not what happened. What happened was the reason they got a little ticked off about it, I think, is they're like, I want to sit there. I want to sit in that seat because they wouldn't. I would not have cared had they not wanted to sit in that seat. They may not even have thought about it. Here's how I know human nature. If I were, if, if I were to give everybody in this place, when we leave, I'm going to stand at the door. If I were, if I say if, if I were to hand out $100 bills to everybody here, and you're like, hey, that sounds pretty good. Okay, again, don't be selective in what you hear me saying. If I were to do that, I am not going to do that. Okay, but if I were, and I hand out hundos, hundos, hundos. Everybody's going, yeah, and the last person, you're the last one out, and I give you a 10. And you, you'd be like, thanks. But every person in here would wonder why. Now, it wouldn't hit everybody the same. Some of you would be like, well, cool, but how come everybody else got 100? Now, you came to church not expecting to get any money. So whether you left with 100 or 10, you're still ahead, right? But something in our human nature would be like, that's not fair. And the devil's like, that's not fair. Tell him that's not, that's not fair. That's not fair. And you would drive off, and you would go to another church, and you'd be like, yeah, the pastor was giving out hundreds, and I only go to 10, so I don't like that pastor anymore. Because I know, I've been in ministry a long time. I know how it works. People leave over really, really crazy things sometimes. And I get an amen if you've been in church your life, all right? But, but I know, again, not everybody would get bent out of shape, but everybody would go, how come I only got 10? It's just human nature. 
So we understand human nature. So Jesus is having some really compassion on human nature. He's not being mean about it. He's just dealing with it. And he's telling all the guys, hey, hey, it's not about getting served. It's about serving. He uses this little story as a teaching moment. To say it's not about what you get out of life. It's about what you give. It's how you can make a difference in the lives of other people. He's like, I have come to give my life for other people. So a life lived for Jesus is a life lived serving others, not lording it over other people. All right, the story continues on. We're going to go to what's called the triumphal entry. And this is when Jesus actually goes into Jerusalem, um, and, and they get all kinds of crazy, and they're all excited about this. So let's read this, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. It says, as they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. At once, you will, okay, that's, he's prophesying, you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Now, this, this happened just the way. The Bible also says in a different book that there was an unbroke colt, had never been ridden before, showing that Jesus has control over even the animal kingdom. When nothing's been broke, Jesus was able to ride this little colt in. And this took place to fulfill what the prophet was spoken uh, through the proverb, well, the prophecy is spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and they did just as Jesus has instructed them. They brought the donkey and, and sure enough, when they were untying the donkey, the guy comes out and he's like, hey, what are you doing? I don't know if he was yelling, but I would. You're taking my colt. I'd be, hey, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, the Lord needs it. All right, cool. Go ahead and ha have it. So again, Jesus knew what was going to happen just like Jesus knows what's going to happen in your life, right? You don't have to worry about those things that he's in control of. Do I need to say that again? You don't have to worry because that was in my notes. You don't have to worry about the things that he is in control of. Is he in control of your life? Yes, he is. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees, which was palm trees, and spread them on the road. That's why we call it Palm Sunday. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! To the son of David, Hosanna means save, means save now. And again, they're thinking, we're overthrowing the Roman government. This is amazing. And they're in a frenzy. They're going crazy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're given a victory parade before the victory ever happened. Only the victory is not going to look the way they think it's going to look. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And they asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the Messiah. This is the man that is going to do it for us. We are tired of Roman oppression. We are tired of what, what we're having to go through. And this is the guy we have been waiting for, been prophesied since the Old Testament. This time is now here. And they're just going crazy. And the same crowd that is going crazy about Jesus coming is going to be the same, or at least part of the same crowd that's going to be shouting, crucify him in a couple days. Why? Because it didn't turn out the way they expected. And I want to show you just an illustration that I have on a, based on the phrase when it said, the whole city was stirred up. They were stirred up. Now, if you know painting, like I know painting, many of you know I'm a painter. I can go to the paint store, and you may not know this, but all paint, when they first make it, starts out white. Okay? It, it's white. It has to be colored. It has to be tinted in order to produce the color that you want. It all starts out white. And once they put the tinting in there on the color that you want, what do they do? They stick it in what? They stick it in a shaker, okay? They, they, and you can shake it all you want. If you don't put any tint or pigment inside of it, you can shake it all you want. You can stir it all you want, but nothing changes. You can go through all kinds of shaking, all kinds of stirring, but if you don't add anything to it, nothing changes. There's a principle here. This whole crowd was stirred at what they saw, but when they saw Jesus die, and they're like, I guess he wasn't who we expected, nothing changed inside of them. You can be stirred up. You can be shaken, but not changed. Something has to be added to it. And a life without Jesus added to it will not be changed. To get the color that you want, you have to add something to it, and that is what Jesus wants you to add to it. As a Christian, you add faith, you add hope, you add love, you add all kinds of things to become what God Now, let me ask you this. What color do you think that paint is on the inside of that can? White. White. It's white. Why do you think that? 
because it's dripping out. What happens if I uh, put a, a different, what if I did that on purpose? What if it's really black on the inside? You really have no way of knowing until you open it up, right? Now, you're correct. It is white. Okay? It even says on there, it's called beefy white. Like Atlas white. My little guy right there, he's my new favorite child. All right? It's white because some of it got spilled out. But if it was a brand new can, you would not know. It would look really nice on the outside. You would have to guess. Let me tell you, once you get shaken, once you get stirred, once you get used, some of it's going to come out, and it's not proof of the color of what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. And we get shaken, and we get stirred, and things happen. Paint will come out of us. Is it Jesus paint, or is it us paint? What I'm hoping is it's the change paint. And we are going to get sloppy. Because if you see a painter that never has paint on his body, he's not a painter. He just looks like it. Every painter should have paint on their bodies. I don't know how many days I I came off this job looking like a raccoon because we painted a lot of black, and I had this black mark right here, and uh, I used it to hide. (laughs) No. (laughs) Let me tell you something, church. Oh, get serious on me here. Let me tell you something. There are times that it's not always Jesus that comes out of us when we get shaken. (laughs) There is times that the flesh comes out. All right? That's what the blood of Jesus is all about. It's all about the forgiveness. It's all about the grace. You see, you can be stirred and not be changed. I don't want to be just a neutral base. I don't want to be just a paint that stays the same color all of life and just trying to get to heaven, being squeaky clean and never having done anything. When you are active in your walk with God, you are going to fall. You're going to get in. All right, let me tell you, if you watch the end of a football game and there's a player that has no grass stains or no dirt on their uniform... What does that mean? They didn't play, right? They didn't. They, they sat the bench the whole time. So you can get to the end of the game nice and squeaky clean. That is not what God is asking us to do. When we are pursuing God with all of our hearts, yes, we are going to make our mistakes again. That's what the blood of Jesus is all about. Jesus then spends this week teaching people how to live. Okay? He's just saying, this, this is how you need to live for me. This is what you need to do. What to expect before he comes back. He talks about end times things. Uh, Before he comes back to rule for good at the end times. How to live, how to love, how to be faithful to do what God has asked us to do. The fruits that prove your love for God. People that think they're right with God but aren't. He deals with that in there. He's like, you look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. And he's talking to religious people who claim to be right with God at that point. He's like, you look good on the outside, but I know what lies within your hearts. He deals with all of it. And let me tell you something. When, when Jesus comes in and he's riding this donkey, I'm going I'm to tell you, tell you something. Because I forgot to tell first service this. That conquering kings don't come riding in on donkeys. Yeah. Conquering kings don't come riding in on poop, 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 little short donkeys that are just going. That's, that's not why. Because the donkey was a symbol of peace. A horse is a symbol of war. Jesus comes riding in on a donkey. I want you to picture this. And the Romans, they hear about the stirring. They see the crowds going crazy, and they're, they're shouting, and they're, they're putting palm branches, and they're throwing their clothes down. They're like, ah! And the, and the Roman centurion looks over and goes, dude, that guy's on a donkey. You see the little donkey? He's right a little donkey. Like, ding, 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 ding. Those donkeys, little, little colt just going, ah! The colt has no idea who he's bringing in. I've heard that story about the colt thinking everybody's cheering for him. And he's like, hey, look at me. Now he's carrying them aside. Kings don't ride in on donkeys. And I think there's probably some of the Romans going, dude, that's, that can't, you can't be serious. He's riding in on a donkey, not a horse, because a horse is a symbol of war in the Bible. Donkeys were a symbol of peace. He comes in as a prince of peace. He doesn't come in as the conquering hero because he's not done yet, church. He's not done yet. He's coming back. And when he comes back, he's coming back on a white horse with the armies of heaven following behind him. All right. He didn't come here first to create this war. He's like, no, my kingdom is far beyond what you guys see today. The expectations that these people had where it's going to happen now. And Jesus is like, you're missing the whole point. I'm going to not just conquer Rome now. I'm not going to do that. My plan is much bigger. My plan is to conquer sin and conquer death. And that is a kingdom-minded thing. Instead of looking at it right now, he's talking kingdom-minded. I'll deal with the kingdom later. I'll deal with the Romans at a later date. And that hasn't happened yet. 
You read in Revelation, it says that Jesus comes back on a white horse and the armies of heaven are following by. And so ladies, you want to ask, are there animals in heaven? Well, there's horses. I don't know if all dogs go to heaven, but there's horses in heaven and there are war horses. And I want to be riding on a horse right behind my Savior with a sword going, yeah, now's the time. That's going to happen. With the armies of heaven, he first came again as a conquering king, but that's not what he is here to conquer as the Roman Empire at this point. He's here to conquer sin and death. So they've got it all wrong. He's riding a donkey. What is it a symbol of? Peace. See if I'm going to get to peace. And, and, a, and a horse is a symbol of war. war. That's coming later. Jesus doesn't come in with this sword. That's going to happen at a later date. It hasn't happened yet. And I believe it's, hap- it's going to happen sooner than we think. Amen. Be right with God, church, because things are going on in this world and the time is ticking down, all right? Things are happening. So be right with Jesus. So he spends his whole week just teaching people how to live. Again, in chapter 26, verse 1 through 2, let's read it up here. He gets a little more specific again. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he told his disciples, as you know, the Passover is in two days or two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Now, crucifixion was something that these people would have been very familiar with. It was miles and miles of Roman roads. Romans, actually, they were pretty amazing. They were pavers. They had, like, paved roads. They had lights on their roads that they would keep lit with oil lamps. And there was hundreds of crosses. It is a very good chance that as Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem, they probably walked by people that had been crucified. Crucifixion wasn't just like, oh, we've never seen this. It was the Romans' method of killing people. So they would have walked by a lot of people, and they weren't super high. They, they had them just a couple feet off the ground. So this would have been a very real thing. And Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm going to get crucified once again. They don't hear it. Once again, nobody goes, really, Jesus? Are you really getting, there's, there's, there's not, it's, it, they're like, it's, it's not going to happen. You're the conquering king. You, you can't get killed. Like this, this kingdom, 12 thrones, remember? Like Jesus it's, it's going to happen the way that we think it's going to happen, not the way that you think it's going to happen. That's really what they're saying. And Jesus, once again, I'm sure it's just going, you guys are really, really dull. You're hard of hearing. You're not understanding what I'm telling you. What I want to do now is we're going to walk through the rest of this chapter. I'm going to read from my Bible. It's not going to be up on the screen. Uh, there's just way too many verses. Again, I would encourage you to do that. So let's go through this. Uh, I'm going to walk through it and get some of the highlights of what happens next. And Judas... Uh, who was the keeper of the, he was actually a thief, but he also a keeper of the money bag, which is really weird that Jesus would do that. Judas uh, is going to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver as prophesied in the Old Testament. The Old Testament said that basically the Messiah will be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And again, it plays out just the way that Jesus said it's going to play out. So he has this triumphal entry, he comes into it, and, uh, and now they're going to have this last supper together. Jesus gets them together, they eat, he breaks bread, he, he passes the, the wine around, he's like, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood. They take it, their last supper will become our communion. That's why we do communion, that was the, symbol, the symbolic thing of that there. So Jesus now is going to predict, in verse 31 through 35, that he is going to get betrayed. That they're going to scatter, and they, they don't believe him. Jesus is like, this is what's going to take place. All these things that have happened the way that Jesus said they were. Now when he says this, they don't believe him. And Then Jesus, Jesus told them. This is chapter 26, verse 31. And then Jesus told them, this very night, you all will fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He's like, I'm going to get killed. I'm going to get buried. I'm going to come back, and then I'm going to go ahead of you into Galilee. Here's the plan. And Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I write good intentions in my Bible right here. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples are like, yeah, 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 us too, us too, us too. We won't. We'll never deny you. Jesus predicts all will desert him. And Peter's actually telling Jesus that he's wrong. He's telling Jesus, no, you're wrong. Jesus is like, you're going to deny me. No, I'm not. Pretty bold, right? And yet some of us do this at times. Like if we struggle, and, and this could be touchy, but it shouldn't be. If we, if we struggle tithing, 
And Jesus said, if you tithe, I'll bless you. And when we don't, we're telling Jesus, you're wrong. Oh, don't touch that, all right? Uh, first service didn't get that one. It's really true, though, right? That's what we're telling Jesus. He said, test me in this. Malachi, read it. It's in Malachi. He says, test me in this. If you tithe, I will bless you. And when we don't tithe, we're telling Jesus, eh, I don't trust that. I don't trust that. If you don't do it, try it. I promise you, you'll see things happen in your life that could never happen without tithing. Okay? It just, it's just true. Giving, it, it just works. We'll, I'll preach on that sometime soon. And so Jesus says this. Peter's disagreeing with him. And having good intentions doesn't get the job done. Doesn't get the job done, having good intentions. As a matter of fact, the book of Luke Read that sometime, chapter 22, verse 31. It retells the same story. Luke is actually a doctor. And, and Luke is telling more details of the story. He says, to, he says, Peter, Jesus says to Peter in Luke's gospel, he says, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith will not fail. And when you come back, strengthen your brothers. And imagine Peter going, what? Jesus, again, he's saying, Satan is asked to sift you, to see what's in you. And we're going to allow him to. Me and my father, we're going to allow him to. And I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. He didn't say, I pray that your physical body would not fail. Because Jesus knows that Peter's physical body is going to fail him. He is going to lie. He says, I pray that your faith won't fail. Like, you're going to make a mistake, but you're not really going to leave me. But when you come back, strengthen your brothers. What he's saying is, you're going to fail. You're going to repent, and when you repent, I want you to lead people to me. I want you to be a rock. I want you to be the strength. And, and this is like a pre-forgiveness card. Before, the, forgiveness, or before the, the crime is ever committed, forgiveness is given. And I've seen this over and over again in marriages, that when two people stand up here and they promise to be loving and graceful and forgiving, what they're saying is, I'm, I'm going to forgive every fault that you have, everything that you haven't told me. I'm going to forgive you before you do it. And it's played out in marriages all around the world. That's why there's no marriage counseling jobs available. Wouldn't that be great? A pre-forgiveness paid card like, a, like that? It's just what Jesus is doing. He is forgiving Peter before Peter even fails him. It's amazing that Jesus would do that, and he gives him hope, and Peter goes on to be an incredible preacher later on. But good intentions doesn't get the job done. Now, in Gethsemane, when Jesus, is, he knows what's going to happen this night, he's about to be betrayed. It says, then Jesus went to his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, you sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. The two sons of Zebedee, who was that? James and John, okay, his two cousins, he took them with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. The Bible says that he sweated drops of blood. He said, stay here and keep watch with me. And we know that it was cold because Peter later would go in by the fire. They had a fire built when Jesus is getting tried, and, and it's a cold, but he's sweating drops of blood. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground, and he prayed. He prayed. And here's a prayer that, a prayer that many of you have prayed and maybe are praying now because you're going through something hard. You're going through something you don't want to go through. Jesus God in a man's body prays this prayer. He says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. I will tell you that this moment Jesus is scared. As a man, as a human, he knows what lies ahead. He knows that his body will get severely beaten, that he will be clubbed, that he'll have a crown of thorns put on his head. He knows that he's going to get whipped and flogged beyond recognition. He's going to get beat. He's going to get mocked. He's already been shown, like, this is what's going to happen. Well, now reality is setting in. He is going to feel this. And he is saying, Father, if there, if there is any other way this can happen, can it happen? Because I really don't want to go through this. I really don't want to go through this. I, I want what it's going to produce, but I don't want the process. And we see the humanness of Jesus here saying, if there's any other way, please let it happen any other way. I don't want, I don't want to go through this. And yet he adds, yet yeah, not as I will, but as you will. In church family, some of you may be in this very position today that you are going through something that is so hurtful, so painful, and you're asking God, can you take this from me? And God says, if I take this from you, you can't be what I want you to be. I, I, if I take you out of the shaker now, 
you can't become the beautiful color that I intend for you to be. And now God doesn't force you to stay in the shaker. God doesn't force you to stay stirred. God doesn't even force himself on you that the color can change. But God's saying, if, if I take you out now, you can't be what I need you to be, what I want you to be. You see, too many people want to jump out of the oven when it gets hot. But you will never become what God wants you to become by jumping out. It's by staying in there. And Jesus, again, I, I love this because we resonate with this. I don't want to go through this, Lord. This hurts. This is painful. This is something that I, I, I don't know that Jesus really knew what it was going to feel like as, as God coming to a man's body, the emotions and the pain and the trauma and the getting deserted. He knew what it was like to have people he loved leave him. That happened in his ministry over and over again. People just, just like, I can't take this. I can't. And Jesus knew what it was like to be rejected. And yet, because of you and because of me, he was going to go through with this. He was going to stick it out. He was going to do what needed to be done to become that sacrificial lamb so that the Passover would no longer have to, have to be celebrated. It's a one and done thing. Jesus would become that final sacrifice for us that believed in that. So Gethsemane will show us this. Good intentions mean nothing without action. Good intentions mean nothing without action. Can you imagine Jesus saying, well, I intended to die for the sins of man until I realized what I would have to go through to make that happen. Jesus didn't pray that. He's like, I thought it all looked good on paper, but boy, now that I'm in it, I really don't want to do this. Well, that part is true. Jesus is like, my flesh does not want to do this, but not my will. Yours be done, Lord. And God's will, again, with it, Jesus would die three days later, come back to life. Having taken on the human or the body of a human, I, love, I just love the fact, I'm going to say it again, that Jesus experienced real pain and real human emotion. He knows what you're going through. The Bible says that very clear. He went through everything we face, every temptation to know what you feel as a human. So he has an incredible amount of compassion for those of us that struggle on a daily basis with things. He understands. Isn't that good to have a God that understands? Amen. I love having friends that understand what we go through. Jesus now gets arrested. It says, meanwhile, while he was speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arranged, uh, or arrived, and with him a large crowd armed with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And now the betrayer had arranged a signal with him. The one I kiss is the man, uh, arrest him. And coming at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. It was just a kiss on the cheek. And Jesus said this. He said, friend, do what you came for. I can't believe Jesus used the word friend. I would have used a few other words, like Christian cuss words, not bad ones, but I would have said some things about this guy, um, and, uh, and then I would have kicked him and ran off, but that's not what Jesus said. And the men stepped forward, they seized Jesus, they arrested him, with that one of Jesus' companions, I believe it was Peter, reached for his sword, drew it out, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear, and this, the high priest's name was Malchus. And the story goes is that, um, I'm going to say, I think it was Peter, the, cut, he, he wasn't swinging for the ear. I don't think Peter was like, you want to see how surgical I can be with this sword? <laughs> like, move your head just a little bit, Malchus. I just want to see how much I can take off. A little off the side. No, he aimed for his head, and Malchus is quickly ducked, and his ear gets chopped off. There's blood everywhere, because you know how head wounds do. And Jesus is like, that's enough. And he gets the ear probably off the ground, and he picks it up, and he puts it back on Malchus's head and heals him. Imagine the stories that Malchus must have told. He gets home and there's blood everywhere, and his wife's like, what happened to you? Let me tell you. We went to arrest this guy. This guy chopped my ear off, and the guy we were going to arrest healed me. You can't say that there wasn't a story out of that from Malchus's perspective going, this guy's legit. Okay, we don't know, but I bet Malchus is in heaven. We'll know because he'll be the one with the ear that's a little yeah. floppy. Just... <laughs> He, maybe he doesn't get the new one. Maybe he gets the old one. I don't know. But he's, I bet he's in heaven. I bet that made a believer out of him. Yeah. Jesus, again, gets arrested, gets hauled off. The disciples take off, and this is what happens. It says, then, verse 56, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And they took off like a bunch of cockroaches when the lights come on. Just, poof, they, they're gone. And what did Jesus say? The shepherd's going to get struck. Everybody's going to flee. And they all took off running, included Peter. Okay, they all left. They took him to the house of a man named Caiaphas, who was the high priest, and he was a crook. Um, he, he was making lots of money off the people, terrible, terrible man, claimed to be a godly man, but he was just ripping everybody off. And they took him to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. Now, this is an illegal trial. 
Their custom said, you cannot try somebody at night, and yet this was night, and they were trying him. So Caiaphas was actually approving of an illegal trial. The man who was supposed to be upholding the law was breaking the law. And they tried Jesus' as night, again, an illegal trial. It says this, they took him there, but Peter, and this is highlighted really bright in my Bible, but Peter followed at a distance. The man who claimed to be dedicated, the man who said, I will be with you to the end, I will, I, I will be with you, is now following Jesus at a distance. And church, let me tell you, anytime trouble happens, things don't go the way you thought, you begin to follow Jesus at a distance, you will be distant from him. You will get distant. It, it's like follow it at a distance. And whenever I write, I see that, I'm like, I don't ever want to follow Jesus at a distance. I want to be close. I want to be right there, and I make a promise to Jesus that I'll be there. I don't want to be following at a distance. He says he entered the courtyard, sat down with the guards to see the outcome. He, now he became a spectator. He was involved, and now he's become a spectator. He's, he gets, he's like, okay, wait, this, this isn't happening the way that I thought. This did not turn out the way I expected. What's going to happen here? And he's watching, and he's kind of seeing what's happening. He would have seen Jesus beat he would have seen Jesus get treated really bad. And what is he doing? He's doing nothing but watching. He's just spectating. You see, there's always a proving part of your good intentions. There's always follow through. It's easy to say something. It's harder to live it out and actually do what you're going to say. Put your actions into words. So what do you do when life gets hard and things don't turn out like you expected? What I know is it's easy to serve Jesus when he's healing you, he's feeding you, he's the celebrity of the day. It's easy to serve Jesus when you're hanging out with the most popular guy in the country. It's not so easy to hang out with Jesus when he's the one that's going away in chains who was supposed to be beating the Romans because that's what you thought was going to happen, and now he's locked up. He's not fighting back. He, he's just allowing this to happen, and he's not even answering the priests. They're asking him all these accusatory questions, and he's not answering them. It's easy to serve God when things are good, but what happens when things don't turn out the way you expect? You see, God's will was still being done here. Peter has access to these events. Again, he watches Jesus go through all this stuff, and yet he doesn't do anything about it. And verse 69 is the result of him following at a distance. It says, now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, and the gospel said there was a fire, and they're just hanging around the fire. And this girl says, you were with Jesus in Galilee. And he said, he denied it before them. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with, was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath, I don't know the man. After a while, those standing there went up to Peter and they said, surely you are one of them for your accent gives you away. And then he began to call down curses on himself. He was a sailor afterwards and it started coming out. And he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now, from my studies, the, the chickens actually were not allowed within the city limits of Jerusalem because if you've ever had chickens, chickens are really messy. Like, they weren't allowed in there. So the fact that this rooster one day, because they can't fly very far, he's just going and going, and he gets lost. GPS is not working. And he gets lost, and he's in Jerusalem. He's at nighttime. He's like, I'm by myself, and there's nobody here. Nobody else is here. There's not even any chicks. <laughs> he's looking around. And he's like, I, I don't even know what to do. I'm here, and I don't think there's supposed to be chickens in Drew, but I got lost. I'm lost. And then he's like, I may as well just crow. So he just goes, and at the same time, Peter was like, I don't know the man. And it's like Peter goes, ah, oh, rooster crowed. There was a rooster in Jerusalem that wasn't supposed to be in Jerusalem that was there by the divine power of God because God said there's going to be a rooster there. How do you know that you are not right where God wants you to be? You might feel all alone. You might feel lost. You might be in a place you're like, I'm not even supposed to be here. And God's like, I got you right where I want you. You're just a rooster. But you're a rooster that has a job. It's like, rooster, you have one job. It's not to lay eggs. It is to crow at the exact time in history that I have you slated to crow. It is when Peter's like, I don't know the guy. So there's going to be a rooster in heaven. He's going to be like, I was the, I was the rooster. 
Maybe the rooster's going to be on the back of Jesus' horse. I don't know. Maybe Peter's got the pet rooster going, yep, as a reminder. I don't know. It's possible. I've never said that before, but I don't know where that came from, but it had to come out. Guys, you might be like the rooster. You might have that one job that God's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, you may not be preaching to thousands. You may, you, might do, you may not be making lots of money, but I have this one job in this particular place that you don't even think you belong, but I'm going to use you, and I'm going to use you in a way that's going to prove my authority of this earth. Even the rooster had a job. Maybe we should make a t-shirt. Even the rooster had a job. See how this all plays out? God has got this whole thing orchestrated. I hope that you will understand and realize that today in your life, God has you in places, in, in just specific times that you might be, I have no idea why I'm here. And God's like, I do. I'm going to ask you today, and I think God is asking you, is you just be faithful with where you're at. Yeah. Keep serving him. Keep doing what's right. When you don't, don't see results, you know that you're not in charge of the results. You're in charge of the obedience. Amen. You just do what God asks you to do. God is in charge of the results Man, I'm preaching long today. And you're a good amen crowd. It must have got me fired up because I told the first crowd, the more you amen, the shorter I preach. That is not working second like service. Come on, brother. So Luke, again, gives us more detail. It's like Jesus, when Peter denied him the third time, it says that, that Jesus and Peter made eye contact. So that Jesus looked at Peter. Peter looked back, and, P and Peter lost it. He just started bawling and ran out. That shows us Peter's heart. He had a tender heart toward Jesus. He did. His flesh got the best of him as it has gotten the best of all of us at times. But why did the crowd who was quickly, or shouting Hosanna quickly start, start shouting crucify him? It was unmet expectations. Let me read you the rest just for the sake of time. Again, they were so convinced that they knew how this was all going to play out. Ellie, if you could come back to the piano, please. Uh, that it didn't turn out the way they thought. They lost hope and they lost faith that Jesus was actually the Messiah. Again, this has proven that no one was waiting at the tomb on the third day. Pastor Stevie's going to tackle this next week. I asked him to do Easter because I did Easter last time. And, and, and he'll probably talk about this. The, no one was waiting there eagerly like, oh, he's going to come out. He said three days later, I can hear that. That didn't happen. Nobody was there. Not one person was there waiting. They all thought, well, he, he was the Messiah in our minds. I guess he's not. You see, but he was still the Messiah. It didn't matter what they thought. It didn't matter whether their expectations were not met. He is still the Messiah church, and he still is today. Amen. He is still the Savior of the world. See, what they were doing, and this is popular, is they were living their truth, but their truth was not truth. This is the truth. Jesus said, I'm going to come back, y'all. He's like, I'm coming back. I'm going to die three days later. I'm going to come back. Whether they believed it or not didn't matter, didn't change the facts. He came back three days later. Amen. Why? Because his word said he was going to. And when God said he's going to start in you, he will finish in you. But you've got to stay in the fire. You've got to stay in the shaker. You've got to stay in that place that may not be comfortable. Why? Because you've got to believe God is doing something in me. Why? Because his word says so. His word says so. God's got good plans for you. Some of you are wanting to jump out of the shaker when it starts getting shaky. That's a deep thought. <laughs> things are getting shaky. It's like, why? why is it shaking? Because he's stirring things. He's getting the color all through you, not just part of it. Can you imagine getting a, I can imagine as a painter, getting a bucket of paint with just the color and staying in one spot and trying to roll that up. You would have streaks everywhere. That's not what God wants in your life. He doesn't want your life to be streaky. He wants it to be full. He wants the color to be everywhere. But you got to stay in the shaker. Jesus comes back like he said he would come back. He does what he says he would do. He keeps his promises. If we don't learn anything from today's lesson, is that even if it comes down to a rooster, comes down to a donkey, God's word is going to come true. I want to be on that train because that's a good train. It's a good place. Amen. Is this doing anything for anybody? I hope it is. What you believe doesn't matter. What's true is what matters. You can believe all kinds of crazy stuff, but it's what's true is what matters. So my challenge for you today is this question. What am I going to do when God doesn't do what I want or expect him to do. Am I going to keep serving him? I'm going to keep saying, God, I guess if it didn't turn out, it's got to be part of your plan because my life is submitted to you, Lord. It didn't turn out the way I thought, but maybe what I thought wasn't near as good as what you have for me. Right. So I'm going to trust you, God, that what your plan is better than my plan. I'm going to keep serving you. I'm going to keep doing what you asked. You see, what you try to prevent, and I don't think I said this first service, what you try to prevent can stop potential. That's like a key phrase that I forgot for service. What you try to prevent can stop the potential. 
And my thought here on this was this. Think about the conception of Jesus. What if Mary was asked before the conception, miraculous, immaculate conception, Mary, here's all the details of what you're going to face as a young woman that's pregnant out of wedlock, knowing in that culture they can kill you for it, knowing the ridicule, knowing the reputation that you're going to have the rest of your life for being pregnant out of wedlock. We know you're engaged to Joseph, but you've had no physical intimacy with man, but you're going to carry this child. What do you think? And Mary would be like, I think we should prevent this pregnancy because I'm not sure I want to go through all of that. But the Messiah wouldn't have been conceived. The Savior wouldn't have born. Some of you may have been conceived out of planning, out of wedlock. Does that matter in God's sight? Absolutely not. God has an absolute plan for your life because every child is his. Every child, I think, is like a pre-planned thing. It's a, there's an idea of what God wants to do with your life. So it doesn't matter how you begin. It matters how you're going to finish. Are you going to finish it? Or are you going to give up when the shaking gets rough? Jesus did not do that. You see, it's bigger than me. Have big picture thinking. God is doing something. I've told you this for years. God is doing something in my life even when I can't see it. I have to believe that. Because it's easy to wave palm branches when life is going great. But will you serve him when it's not going the way you like? That's why staying in the word of God is so important. God has a plan. He's got a purpose for me. I'm going to stay in the shaker. I'm going to stay in the shaker. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. When I feel like giving up, I'm going to keep going. When I feel like giving up, I'm going to have good friends around me, a good pastoral staff that says, hey, just keep going. We'll make it. We'll make it together because we got to have the team. Amen? we got to have the team. Yeah. All right. I've done preached a long, long time, but we'll only do one service next week. <laughs> but in all seriousness, guys, I want you to, I want church to be fun, but I also want it to be serious that your eternity lies in your decision. There's heaven and there's hell. That's all there is. There's heaven and there's hell. We are going to die. Every single one of us will take our last breath. Are you ready to meet Jesus? He's ready to meet you. But he, he wants to meet you on his terms, and his terms is you have to accept the gift that I gave you. That's what Easter week is all about. It's about him dying in my place. And so many of us in this place have said, I can't make it on my own. I know I need Jesus. I need that forgiveness. I need that grace, and we have accepted him into our life. But maybe there's a couple of you that have not. And so I would ask all of us just to bow our heads for this moment. What I, I like to do is I say you can give your life to Jesus in private and then you're expected to live for him publicly. But this is a holy moment, a moment that if God's dealing with you and he's calling you home and he's like, son, daughter, I love you. I'm not mad at you. I've seen your sins. I've seen your failures. I love you in spite of that. Just like he showed that to Peter before Peter did it, he forgave him for it. And that's what God wants to do to you, but you have to ask him to do that. Now, if that's you today, I'm going to ask you to be bold and brave and just lift your hand up. Say, Stan, that's me. I need to give my life to Jesus today. I do want to spend eternity in heaven. Is there anybody in this place that needs to make that decision right now? It's like, I, I want to spend eternity in heaven. And I understand I have to give my life to Jesus to do this. You are correct. That's what the Bible says. Anybody at all? Okay, all right. Not seeing any. Okay, all right. I see your hand. Anybody else? Just wait a couple more. Okay, I see your hand. You can... Anybody else? Just take a couple more moments. Don't miss this moment. All right. And here's how we do it here. For those who did raise their hands, we just pray a prayer together. And if you didn't raise your hand and you wanted to, I'm going to ask you to just pray this prayer with us to give your life to Jesus, to get your sins forgiven. And let's pray it with those who raised their hand. Dear Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Change me on the inside. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says your name just got written in the book of life. Amen. Amen. Well, I love y'all. The rest of you, if you're going through something, hang on, okay? Just get up and do what's right. Get up and do what's right. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? God's got a plan for you. He does. And uh, man, I preached a long time today, um, and I'm not sorry. I love you. I guess we don't have Wednesday, so I had to let it all out. Uh, that, so that works out. But have a wonderful day, wonderful week. And God bless you again. Have, if you got Easter eggs to drop off, we will have a, a container out by that the door you come in. If nobody's here, you can just put them in there. Love you. Have a great day.